Thank you for inviting me. I'm Dan Britt from the University of Central Florida. I'm going to talk about the lunar regolith. Um, as I said, uh, I, uh, I lead an organization called the, oops, the Center for Lunar and Asteroid Surface Science class. And that's part of the NASA Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. And NASA funds us to do regolith-related science um, for uh, airless bodies. And we do a number of things. So I'm mostly a rock guy. I look at the rocks, and regolith is about rocks. Regolith is from the Greek regos, a blanket, and lithos, stone. Um, and it's really the, ma the mantle of fragmented and unconsolidated debris that everywhere covers bedrock. And of course, various kinds of terrestrial soils are actually regolith. And basically the moon is almost entirely covered with regolith. You see very little bedrock. And how do we know about lunar regolith? Well, there's been a number of missions. We've had the six man missions, but we have a lot of samples. 2,200 samples from Apollo, samples from the Russian Lunas, and also we have about 400 lunar meteorites. And the characteristic of lunar samples are that you basically have two kinds of lunar lithologies. You have this white stuff, which is made up of the mineral anorthosite, and this is basically the, the, the material of the lunar highlands. That's 85% of the lunar surface. And the origin of this you've probably gone over already is from a, an early magma ocean. And that's basically the original crust of the moon that's been subsequently shattered and, uh, and uh, damaged by major impacts. On top of this, in the great impact basins are various kinds of basalt this is an Apollo 15 basalt, a vesicular basalt. And that's what we see in the lunar mark. Impacts basically dominate the regolith at all scales. From basin forming inputs, impacts down to micrometeorites. So this is, the top picture is the scale of the whole moon, and the bottom picture is a crater produced by a micrometeorite. That's about, that has a diameter of about 10 microns. And what these things do from a geologic sense is they excavate a, a huge amount of material. And this is really what forms the basis of the surface units on the moon and of course, other planets and certainly asteroids. For example, the Imbrian Basin is 1200 kilometers in diameter. Uh, 600 kilometers from the ring edge, you still have a ejecta that's 400 meters thick just from that one impact. And what these basin forming impacts have done is fractured the crust down to about 25 kilometers. So let's talk about regular stratigraphy. And basically we're talking about three major zones. And what we'll mostly be interacting with in any future exploration, and what we've done already, is the, the topmost regolith soil. And the regolith soil in this upper layer, and this is about six to, you know, four to six meters uh, thick, depending on your location, is essentially a collection of fine particles uh, that are compacted to various levels. On the on the absolute top is a very fluffy layer of very dusty material, about 20 centimeters. And this is very loose, very fluffy, created by micrometeorite bombardment. Uh, where it's been bombarded a lot, it is what you call mature regolith. We'll talk about that some more. And below the fluffy stuff, you, it, the soil steadily becomes more compact. So you go from a density uh, around one for the, the fluffiest stuff down to a density of about two 
as you go down. And the, the regolith becomes progressively more compact with depth. And it's very poorly sorted. Um, contains lots of lithic fragments, and we'll talk about that in a, a few minutes. As I said, the depth, vary, the, the depth varies. The depth varies with basically with age of the material. So the older the surface, the highlands, for instance, that regolith soil layer is deeper. And for the Mari, the regolith is, is thinner, four or five meters versus 10 meters on the highlands. And this is an area that's been, this is a, a, a material that's been gardened and overturned by impacts and constantly being, being churned. And of course, remember that Highlands is 85% of the surface of the, of the moon and it's, and all the, uh, the polar regions are, are Highlands material. So Highlands regolith is, if you're interested in polar regions, that's what you have to, have to worry about. So the, so the uh, uppermost soil is dominated by micrometeorite impact and the churning and creation of, of dust and, and loose soil. Accumulation rates are on the order of about a millimeter and a half per million years. And this is really dominated by, by fine particle sizes. So the mean particle size is between 40 and 130 microns. Average is about 65 to 70 microns. It's really dominated by the fine stuff. And as you go down, the stuff becomes more compact with depth. These are, this is a, an actual picture of a Apollo core tube that's about uh, 65 centimeters of core tube. And you get more compacted with, with depth. Um, and the stratigraphy you find with depth uh, is mostly a function of nearby small impacts. And so what that does is it produces uh, layers of blocky material mixed in with finer material. And seismic shaking is probably compacting it over time. And so, so the soil retains this poorly sorted profile of ejecta blocks and cobbles and fine material. And that makes collecting core tubes kind of challenging. Uh, a, a good analogy, although not for a geologist who lives in Florida, is glacial till, which is a poorly sorted collection of a variety of particle sizes, blocks, and cobbles. And so when the Apollo astronauts first tried to do core tubes, they were expecting a very loose, deep, fluffy regolith. And they found that it was a lot tougher to drive core tubes than they thought. And core tube driving was a constant problem throughout the whole Apollo mission because they really didn't expect how, uh, how hard it would be. Uh, what happens is upper layers, it gets gardened. That is, the impacts disperse and mix the surface layer down to these 10 or so meters. And you can actually see the effect of maturization. That is, uh, gardening and bringing up uh, more mature material with their effect on, on raid craters. A raid crater is something that drives through the regolith layer and excavates fresh material and you see relatively bright rays coming out of the crater. What gardening does is it will eventually erase those rays over time as things get more mature. And I'll talk about what regolith maturity means in a minute. What gardening means for lunar resources and lunar ice deposits is you have to recognize that whatever was emplaced near the surface in ancient times, three or four billion years ago, will have over time been gardened and diluted and mixed. And so gardening is going to be more intense on older surfaces, like the poles. And this is going to mix and scatter any polar ice. So keep that in mind. 
Um, the other thing is that micrometeorite bombardment and thermal stress actually erode the blocks and rocks that are on the surface of the moon, and they have a, a distinct lifetime of a few hundred million years. So buried rocks can, can survive just fine. The example I have here is a rock that was buried partially under the soil. And so where it's exposed, you've seen that the surface is rounder and, and eroded, and where it's protected, it's highly angular and not pitted at all. The pits probably come from micrometeorite bombardment and to some extent from thermal stresses and, um, and cracks that develop from the rather extreme variation in lunar night and day. And so if you want to, um, to get rocks out of the regular soil, this is something that you'd probably need a, a rake for. Going down from the, top, from the top 10 meters, you run into a zone that is really um, very coarse grained, what's called mega regolith. That is the, the, the massive ejecta um, and melt sheets from the basin forming impacts. And the depth of this layer depends upon location. Where you get most of the uh, mega regolith, of course, is on the near side uh, in the boundaries of the Mari layers, because those are the major impacts. And those are the ones that create these vast ejecta blankets. And so that can be anywhere from a few hundred meters to kilometers in depth. And of course, there's no shortage of, of uh, lunar basins. Most of them are on the near side, but uh, what these do is that they contribute substantially to the near side depth of regolith that is piled up on top of the original crust. And you look at uh, uh, Clementine topography, uh, here are the the major near side basins. And the big far side basin, of course, is the um, South Pole Aiken Basin. But the, this material piles up vast mega regolith sheets near the basins. And if you look at the cumulative basin ejecta, various people have modeled this. It's uh, relatively thin near the poles, but really is very thick, close to the, the basin areas. And a useful thing to remember is that, although it might be kilometers thick, this is a relatively thin coating over bedrock. Uh, but it's basically everywhere. So you only get bedrock exposures in small areas like central peaks or crater walls. Um, where it's hard to uh, retain or, or accumulate more regolith. The effect of these large impacts is that that will drive the form and distribution of lunar water deposits. Because what happens is that ice is not deposited in a static environment. The large impacts are gonna have significant effects uh, in burying volatile deposits that start out on the uh, on the surface but then with nearby major impacts we get buried by the ejecta material so you would expect to find an ice stratigraphy um, where your ice rich horizons are interspersed with ice poor ejecta that come from the nearby major impacts and it's not just major impacts. It's going to apply at all scales um, or around the entire uh, pole down to meters or smaller levels. Um, and uh, it, it's just a feature of how you will be able to uh, deal with this resource. Um, 
my ex postdoc Kevin Cannon has published a couple of papers on this uh, with me as a co-author. But uh, basically, we've modeled the stratigraphy and the the mass of the the depth of these um, ejected deposits and how they would impinge on the permanently shadowed regions. And one thing that you can expect is that during the early days of the moon, when you're likely accumulating volatiles from heavy bombardment and, and ice rich um, asteroids coming in, that you'll have periods where you form ice layers and then bury them very abruptly with these major impact events and then accumulate more, bury them more, accumulate more, bury more. And all the time, you're gonna have smaller impacts hitting these big craters and gardening and mixing the layers that, that have been laid down. So it's a very dynamic process and something you need to keep in mind when you're developing ISRU strategies and exploration strategies for this kind of resource. <clears throat> so the last part of the regolith column is basically the fractured crust. Structurally disturbed materials and just fractured in situ crust. Um, the bottom line here is that the bedrock on the moon is going to be kilometers deep in ejecta. And when you get to the bedrock, it's going to be shattered by the same kinds of basin forming impacts. Uh, in the Mari areas, the Mari volcanism has overlaid the uh, shattered crust of the impact basins with, with basaltic eruptions. And uh, that's presenting the material that you're dealing with now. So, what goes on to the actual regolith itself is it's exposed to the space environment and it weathers. And we call, you know, uh, space weathering is really a general term for all the alterations that are su suffered by solid materials exposed to this, the space environment. And that includes damage from cosmic rays, damage from solar wind, damage from micrometeorite bombardment, uh, the chemical effects of solar wind implantation. And what happens is that space weathering, its effects depend upon the chemistry of the target material. For lunar materials, what you do is you get uh, weathering darkens lunar material and reddens its reflectance spectra. So our Really, our type section for space weathering has been the moon. And the moon actually has a fairly strong response to space weathering. Because um, what happens is that lunar, red, red, lunar weathering generates nanophase iron on the grain surfaces and makes glassy rims. And this creates an extremely optically active surface and essentially takes what is a very spectrally strong signal from, from normal lunar uh, basalts. This is a uh, Apollo 12 rock, and this is a soil that was derived from the same rock that was uh, collected in situ. And essentially, the mineralogy of these two spectra are identical. One is derived from the other. But the effect is that you change the chemistry by adding this nanophase iron and glassy agglutinates. And it strongly attenuates the reflection, strongly darkens the, uh, the material. So other regolith effects, comminution, breaking up the rocks and minerals into smaller particles. And so impacts are gonna grind down uh, rocks at all scales. Of course, the major impacts produce ejecta blocks and big ejecta uh, uh, distributions. And of course, 
Um, micrometeorites are an extremely strong effect on the moon because of the enhanced gravity from the Earth-Moon system. So they produce stronger effects than you would in other places in the solar system, particularly on asteroids. And I'll get to that in a minute. And one thing micrometeorite bombardments do is they produce agglutinates. And agglutinates are the welding of mineral and rock fragments together by micrometeorite produced glasses. And micrometeorite bombardment is high enough energy, high enough velocity that you melt and vaporize material and that recondenses or freezes and welds together um, the resulting soil. Um, this is probably limited to the moon and Mercury since this require this actual this action requires very high impact speeds, um, greater than 10 kilometers a second. So you typically don't find agglutinates very abundant on things like asteroids because the average impact velocities there are too low to produce this kind of extensive melting. You do see a small amount of agglutination on asteroids, but the, the major effect is on the moon. And in the early days of the Apollo program, this was uh, this uh, uh, comminution effect was considered to be a major problem. Uh, many people don't remember this now, but in the 1960s, Tommy Gold of Cornell uh, raised this concern that you can do a little bit of math and decide that micrometeorite bombardment over the age of the solar system should produce a fluffy dust layer that would be very thick, tens of meters, very low density. And the worry was that when the lunar module landed, the, astro the, the module and the astronauts would sink below the surface because that wouldn't be able to support the, the module. And because of this concern, NASA flew the robotic uh, lander surveyor program, cost about $3 billion, just to make sure that the, the dusty surface of the moon would not swallow the astronauts. And of course, agglutination was the reason Tommy Gold was wrong. What happens is that micrometeorites not only break things down, but they also build things up. They also weld stuff back together. And it joins small particles to form bigger particles. And eventually, what happens is the surface reaches an equilibrium. And that equilibrium is about 20 centimeters of very dusty material. Over time, that dusty material becomes more mature. So as you're bombarding this stuff, you're creating more agglutinates, more nanophase iron. And so uh, a relatively fresh soil is coarser, has less glass, fewer agglutinates, less nanophase iron. <clears throat> Over time, micrometeorite gardening makes it more and more mature. That is, it gets darker, redder, uh, less spectral contrast, more glass, more agglutinates. And so you actually see um, a trend of increasing agglutinate content along the long maturity. Another way you can make fines, and this is probably what is important certainly on, on asteroids, is that thermal stress from diurnal temperature variations uh, can break up rock surfaces. And so this adds to another process along with micrometeorite impacts for producing fine grain fragments. And these fine grain fragments are a problem. They're called dust. And one of the things that people forget about in the Apollo program is just how dirty the astronauts got moving around on the surface. And so 
you can see the, the used um, uh, spacesuits here just absolutely covered with, with lunar dust. And it was everywhere. And that was the problem that they never actually solved in, uh, during the Apollo program. Because the fundamental design was to bring the spacesuits inside the uh, lunar module. And there was, they tried various schemes of removing the dust from the suits, and none of those worked. So there are a lot of dust hazards. Um, it's, it's not good to, bring it, to breathe in dust, and that does irritate the skin. But the real problem is that it degrades support systems, connectors, airlocks, filtration systems, uh, mechanical systems, gears, seals, lubricants. And also, uh, it degrades scientific instrumentation. So that's a problem in any future lunar exploration is figuring out how to separate the astronauts from the dust and keeping the dust off your instruments. And there are various schemes that, are pe that people are working on to accomplish that. Um, more regolith processes, solar wind effects. Solar wind does a lot of things um, along, with, uh, along with galactic cosmic rays. Spoliation, that is forming of elements, is a result of cosmic ray impacts that cause neutrons and protons to fall off. Sputtering, so that's atoms ejected from solid material due to the bombardment of energetic particles. Um, charging, and we'll get into charging uh, some more later. But <clears throat> basically, you're going to build up positive charges um, on lunar dust, and those can get repelled and lofted. And also, implantation and vaporization. So, what happens with the solar wind is that it basically saturates the entire surface with hydrogen. And the hydrogen can be highly reactive in changing the chemistry of the regolith and creating very strong reducing conditions. So when you heat the regolith um, from micrometeorite impact, for instance, what happens is that the implanted hydrogen is going to going to drive reduction reactions. And so iron-rich silicates like olivine and peroxine are going to be converted to reduced iron and iron-poor silicon products. Um, this is what produces submicron iron. And it quite often is recondensed and suspended in this cooling or freezing uh, glass. And that makes a powerful reddening agent. And of course, the any low temperature phases can be vaporized during these impact events. But the problem, of course, is that you're deep in a gravity well. And anything that gets vaporized, most of it is going to recondense on the surfaces around you because they're going to be fairly cold and you're going to be stuck in this gravity well. So you have a lot of potential for chemistry and a lot of uh, impact and vaporization products that are rattling around the surface. Other factor is that charging can, can transport dust. So um, UV photons are going to um, eject electrons from sunside particles. And this will result in a positive charge on the, on the illuminated side of the sun negative on, the, on the, the, the dark side. And also, you're, you get this from energetic particle radiation um, and also implantation of solar ions. And so the day side of the moon becomes positively charged to about 10 to 18 volts. The night side becomes negatively charged to roughly 10 volts. And, uh, and you also can get a, a indirect charging from this. Uh, 
because the ejected electrons will be acquired by another particle producing a negative charge. And so um, what happens is that positive, positive charges build up in the finer regular size fraction and the small particles get repelled from the surface. This lofts these things. Uh, there's a, quite a controversy on how much lofting is going on, but there are observations of lofting to, to at least meters. Uh, and this is, these, these are things that are associated, this lofting phenomenon is associated with uh, the transition between, with the terminator, the transition between light and dark on the lunar surface. On polar regions, it becomes more complex because of course you've got this patchwork of illuminated areas and shadowed areas. And the thought here is that the polar craters, the permanently shadowed areas have a ne negative charge and the surrounding uh, illuminated areas have a net positive charge. So that's something to consider and something to remember when you're trying to uh, get into these permanently shadowed regions. Another thing to talk about in regolith is trafficability. One of the ironies, of course, is that a lot of um, things that are learned from the Apollo program have not been well preserved in the scientific literature. And one of these issues is the effect of pro prolonged traffic on the lunar regolith. And what the astronauts found is that prolonged activity seriously degrades lunar soil compaction. Basically what's happened when the Apollo landers landed was that the braking rockets swept loose material out of, um, out of the immediate area of the uh, descent module. But so you had relative, uh, the, the really thick dusty material was, was not right around the, the spacecraft. But what happened is after a few days of walking back and forth and working in the vicinity of the lander, the crew's boots actually worked that material into very, a very loose quagmire and made it harder and harder to traverse. So the more you churn and use the regular surface, the more it's likely to become disaggregated and loose and, and, and harder to move in. So something to keep in mind when you're designing your lunar base and your lunar experiments. The other thing to keep in mind is that landing and takeoff those rocket plumes are going to turn the regolith into high velocity ejecta. The landing plume uh, that came from uh, the Apollo mission that landed near the one of the surveyor spacecraft basically sandblasted that surveyor very effectively. And the um, analysis by some of the members of my, my institute class suggests that for larger uh, landers um, in the class of the Apollo lunar module and larger, you're going to actually loft high velocity ejecta um, into lunar orbit. And so that you would have enough um, impart enough energy to the, the regolith so that you would have ejecta that would essentially be able to impact, for instance, the, the lunar return module. So something to keep in mind. Um, trafficability in ice-rich areas is also going to be a problem because remember, <coughs> the ice is holding up the surface. If you have a significant amount of ice, any removal or volatilization is going to change that surface. Mining that ice has caused terrain collapse. 
Um, for the shadowed regions, the rovers are going to probably be warmer than the surroundings. So repeated movement will cause volatilization and compaction. One of the things I point out is that in rural areas, what you have one feature are things called sunken lanes. These things were not excavated by, by people make, wanting to make a below grade road. What happened was that repeated traffic over the centuries compacted the soil and caused the road to, to sink relative to the, uh, the fields. And you should expect something like that to happen in high traffic areas um, on the moon. So to wrap up, regolith is everywhere. That's what covers the moon. Very rare to get bedrock, very hard to get to it. Regolith thickness is a function of surface age. If you're interested in exploring polar regions, that's old highlands and orthocytic rich crust. It's going to have a thick regolith. Regolith stratigraphy, the top of the regolith stratigraphy is a dusty, loose, agglutinate rich layer. The top six to 10 meters is impact gardened and mixed. The mega regolith comes from ejecta from large Im impacts and lunar basins. Impact ejecta and gardening will make it difficult to predict what you will get in terms of lunar polar ice deposits because that stuff is very dynamic. And of course, space weathering is pervasive and it's going to alter the surface material. Dust is also pervasive. It's going to be a major operational challenge. And traffic ability may also be a major challenge. So I'll just leave you with a picture of the moon. And we see the near, you can go out tonight and see the near side. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, please let me know. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, <coughs> And, and, and ask the questions. Uh, any questions? <clears throat> and also in my last slide, I have um, some useful reference material that I like. 